favorites because of this picture, which appeared only a couple of months ago. Unfortunately for me, the book came out before the picture, so I don't have this picture, but I'll cheat and just put it here. It's okay. M87 is a super giant elliptical galaxy. Most people just saw this, but that's just one tiny part of M87. It's a giant elliptical, 53 million light years away. It's in Virgo. In the Virgo cluster, there's over 2,000 galaxies in the single cluster. Now we have an interesting phenomenon here, which is the uh, this jet of charged particles, and this was discovered by Heber Curtis some years ago. And the the charged particles get caught up in twisted magnetic fields, okay, due, due to the dynamics of the, the black hole and the uh, accretion disk. And we have these twisted fields and the charged particles get caught up and produce this characteristic blue light that's called synchrotron radiation. Okay, it's just a blue light. Now this is another big supermassive black hole. So this is the biggest one in our vicinity. This is 6.6 .6 billion solar masses. And uh, it's actually not too hard to compute the mass of a black hole. Okay, I'll do that in a, another book. It's just some, again, high school algebra. Anyway, the interesting thing about the black hole is that it's a curved black hole. That means it's rotating. It's a rotating black hole, and who was Kerr? Roy Kerr was a Kiwi, also from Canterbury, and he solved Einstein's field equations, which is fiendishly difficult, and produced the results for a rotating, the formulas for a rotating black hole. And uh, he became very famous when he did this, and this black hole is a curved black hole, this is rotating. It's about five solar systems in diameter. This is a radio telescope picture, the EHT. It's eight telescopes linked together by atomic box, so that effectively makes one giant telescope. And they produced this picture. There's the shadow of the black hole. And that's the accretion disk. This is coming towards us. That's receding. Okay. And Roy Kerr was at Canterbury University. Beatrice Tinsley was at Canterbury University. And Ernest Rutherford was at Canterbury University. There's nothing special about that university to produce three such great scientists. Roy Kerr is one. He's won more awards for his uh, achievement than I've had hot dinners. If you check out uh, his the website, the Wikipedia entry for Roy Kerr. Okay. Actually, he did come to my house one time, but I forgot why. So, I'm sure it was something very important. We didn't discuss relativity, but I can't remember why he was there. Okay. Anyway, I bet him. And he's a brilliant bridge player too. He's an international bridge player. He represented New Zealand and Bridge at times. Okay. All right, now here's M94. This is a close-up picture of M94. It's actually much bigger than this. And uh, it's a giant spiral, 16 million light years, fairly close. And it has inter an inner ring. This is the inner ring. And it's this bit of yellow that we're seeing up there. It's got an inner ring, and it also has an outer ring. The question is, how do these rings form? Um, it seems to be because of some dynamics due to the, the bar at the center. It's kind of an oval-shaped bar, not a, a rectangular shape, but an oval-shaped bar. And that seems to have caused the, the ring feature. The interesting thing is, it seems to lack dark matter. Now, some polar scientists have been studying this recently, and they found that the distribution of the velocities of the stars in the outer regions and the periphery of the galaxy do not require any dark matter for explanation. All they require is Kepler and Newton. Okay, just the simple equations for like the solar system. Okay? And in most galaxies, the, the stars around the periphery are moving much faster than they should be according to Kepler's dynamics. The stars on the outside, like Pluto orbiting the sun, they should be moving much slower than the stars were moving. Mm -hmm. It turns out they're not. It 
turns out if you, if you look at a graph of the velocities, the graph tends to just plateau all the way out to the edge. And that's really unusual. And so astronomers have invoked this mysterious dark matter. Nobody knows what it is. I certainly don't. And it's never been seen. But if you stick it in there as an ad hoc solution to the problem of why the velocities just level off instead of going down like they should, then everything makes sense and all the, uh, all the uh, graphs look perfect. So you have dark matter, the graphs will just plateau like they should. Okay, not everybody's happy with that. Okay, I'm not very happy with that. But uh, anyway, they found that the velocities of this galaxy here are just fine without any dark matter. So that makes this galaxy a little bit special besides the, the rings. Okay, there's another galaxy too. This isn't the only one. There's another galaxy, NGC 1502, also seems to lack dark matter. And the case for this one is even stronger. Try another one, pinwheel M101. This is uh, called a grand design spiral because it's beautiful. And it's a little bit distorted. The arm here is possibly a bit distorted from the interaction with this guy. The distance is very well constrained because there's 827 cepheids in it. And Hubble loves cepheids because they're distance indicators. And so the distance is very well constrained at 20.9 billion light years, which is fairly close, not very far. And it's uh, roughly about the size of the Milky Way, maybe just a little bit bigger. This, what's interesting about this one is it doesn't seem to have a black hole at its core. Nearly all the major galaxies do, but they can't find any black hole in the center of this galaxy. Also, the center is a bit off-center. Uh, if, if you find the, the, uh, the center of mass, it's not there. It's not exactly there where the core is. So the core is a little bit off center, and there doesn't seem to be a, a black hole at the center, a supermassive black hole. It could be they haven't found it, or it could be it's not there. If it's not there, that's interesting, because why do all the other galaxies have one, and the pinwheel doesn't? I don't know. It's a good question. Here's a companion. This is a dwarf galaxy, NGC 5474. You can see this has been distorted by interaction, tidal interaction with the pinwheel. So this has been all pulled out of this dwarf galaxy mm -hmm. companion. Okay, so here's another one. This one's on the cover of the book because the picture is so cool. Look at that. You've never seen the likes of that before. What is it? This is ARC uh, 227 or NGC 474. ARC, by the way, compiled this catalog of peculiar galaxies. He called them peculiar. This is very <coughs> peculiar. Right. And these are ones that needed further research because of various anomalies of one sort or another. This is uh, NGC 470, a spiral here. They're uh, interacting. It's actually a stream of uh, hydrogen gas that's uh, atomic hydrogen connecting the two, but we can't see it in visible light, but it's there. And uh, the question is, how do these shells form? First of all, there's two types, well actually there's three, but two major types of shell galaxies. And some of the shell galaxies have these shells, these arcs, all in one line, and that's type one. Type two, they're not all in one line. Okay. <laughs> These aren't in one line, there's an arc there, and it's up there, right over here. So the arcs are kind of displayed in a nice fashion around. But how could they form? Well, you need a computer to simulations to run and try to figure this out. Well, that's been done. And it's been found that this galaxy here is actually the merger of two galaxies, and they were merging essentially along radial orbits. So, you know, the universe is expanding outward, everything's moving out, and the, along the radius, if you get two galaxies colliding along the same radius, you can produce this sort of effect. This happened four to eight billion years ago, so the dust, the cosmic dust has settled, and you still have the preservation of these arc features. Okay. So it's quite stunning. 
Now, these are used sometimes to analyze other theories of gravity, because not everybody likes dark matter. There are other theories of gravity which can explain the rotation curves of galaxies without dark matter. But to do that, this is modified Newtonian dynamics. You have to modify Newton's law of gravitation. So you're kind of tampering with, with God here. <laughs> yeah. You've got to not modify Newton's law. But if you do that, and an Israeli uh, physicist, Mordecai Milgram, he did that. And with modified gravity, with his formulas, he doesn't need dark matter. He can explain the rotation velocities of uh, uh, spiral galaxies without any problem. So this is also a test bed. Can Mond, it's called Mond, can Mond explain this sort of phenomenon? And there's various other ones, as we'll see. There's not only Mond, but there's a half a dozen other alternative theories that don't require dark matter. But they're very abstruse, and most astronomers, I would say, believe in dark matter. Even though nobody's seen it ever, the evidence seems to be there, and it seems to be compelling enough to convince most astronomers that it exists. Okay. So here's some other beautiful galaxies up here at the top. NGC 3808 A and B. This is A, that's B. They've interacted. They're 320 million light years distant, so we're getting out there in space. They've had a close encounter, obviously, you can see. And this is the result. There's a bridge of galactic material, dust and stars, right? and gas. That's about the radius of the Milky Way galaxy, that little bridge there. And um, what happens is the material gets wrapped around the poles of the spiral galaxy on the left. And that's called a polar ring galaxy because there's a ring around the poles. And here's another polar ring galaxy. This is uh, NGC 2685. And this was from the disruption of a dwarf satellite. So this could happen to the Milky Way. If this dwarf became too close, it gets completely disrupted. The material gets strewn all around the poles of the galaxy. So these are the two basic mechanisms, disrupting a dwarf or a close encounter that produce this type of polar ring galaxy. So that's kind of a beautiful picture you've probably seen that in some Hubble books. Okay, now here's another galaxy which is interesting because it has two populations of stars that are going around in opposite directions. So this is lenticular, an SO galaxy in the Virgo cluster. Nearly all the galaxies have the stars all rotating in the same direction. And in this case, it is not true. This has two counter-rotating populations of stars. This was detected by Vera Rubin in 1992. And in the first uh, third of the disk, there is the disk, in the first third of it, one population of stars is going one way, let's say clockwise, the other is going counterclockwise. And again, this requires some explanation. How can this happen? Because in the normal formation of galaxies, everything's revolving the same way. And so you need a computer simulation to work this out, and it's been done. And here's the two galaxies, this is gas, this is the stars. And you can see after uh, uh, 500 million years, this takes a long time. It's all like in slow motion. But they actually collide. And um, the, the collision, you can see, produces a lot of debris. And after a certain period of time, the debris starts to organize itself. And then finally, you end up with this. But what you do end up with in the computer simulation, because you can see what the stars are doing, you will end up with half the stars going one way and half going the other in the same region. There are some galaxies where you have concentric rings. One ring's going this way, the other ring's going that way. But this is all in the same region. Luckily, there's lots of space. None of the stars collide with each other, but uh, it all happens in the same region of the galaxy. Okay, so this is what happened, and the the angle of the approach 
that these, these galaxies uh, collide with is very, very important. So that determines all sorts of different dynamics in the aftermath when you end up down here. Okay, so I don't say how the, the approach looks, do I? No, 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 no. I don't say how this happens. I can't remember either. Okay. <laughs> Centaurus A, this is again a southern hemisphere favorite. A big favorite with uh, radio astronomers because they can hear this along with the sun and probably not much else. But um, this is quite a stunning display. It was discovered from a Sydney suburb by John Dunlop, 1826. It has supermassive black hole, 55 million solar masses, not that big, maybe 10 times the size of our own, but not a thousand times like in the Milipolo galaxy. But it does have these relativistic jets, meaning they move at almost the speed of light. And these jets of material are coming out each end and they're very energetic. The x-rays are here in blue, and the submillimeter wavelengths are in orange. And of course, we've got this uh, dust lane here, which is very conspicuous. I've even photographed this once, and even if you're a terrible photographer, it looks beautiful because of this conspicuous dust lane. It's a region of active star formation, and it's thought to be the merger, the merger with a spiral galaxy. Uh, because normally ellipticals don't have such, such features like this. They're pretty amorphous. Okay, so this one's quite a stunning beauty, and we'll see some jets, some more jets, uh, hopefully. Now, this is another interesting one from ARC 147. This is page 10 in the sky. And this is also two galaxies that interacted. They're 430 million light years away, pretty far. And what happened was there was an off-center collision between that galaxy there, and where's the other galaxy? It's the brown bit there. That's what it looks like. That galaxy, the brown bit, and that one there. And they collided about 50 million years ago. How did they know that? Well, actually, the ring of blue stars is expanding. And so just by working out the rate it's expanding, you can work out when it was just one not a ring at all, but everything was in one place, and that was 50 million years ago. Okay. You can see that that triggered off intense star formation, the collision between the two, and we've got this um, beautiful blue ring of hot blue stars, and these blue O-type stars, they, they're like rock stars, they, they live hard and die fast. <laughs> so. That's what's happened here in 50 million years. Some of these blue stars would have died out already after a few million years. And some of them will produce, uh, will be in a binary uh, relationship with another star, and some of them will collapse into neutron stars or black holes, okay? And so in pink, we've got these neutron stars and black holes that are feeding off a companion and producing massive amounts of X-rays. And here they are, these are the, the rock stars. This here, actually, also producing enormous amounts of X-ray, is a quasar. That's a quasar, producing the same thing from essentially the same mechanism. Okay. So these are ultra-luminous X-ray sources because they're so intense. And the X-rays they give off are really voluminous. Now, here's another little, uh, get together between some galaxies, R194, and uh, actually there's uh, two, two galaxies up top that are in the process of uh, merging. You can see, uh, I probably killed this here. There's this one here, and there's this one here, and they're actually merging. There's this guy over here, and nothing uh, is happening with this one because I think it's much further away, and it's not really part of the picture. So we can ignore that one. And we've got this one down here. All of these are about 470 million light years away. This cascade here is about the size of the Milky Way. Just that blue cascade. Those are hot blue stars, knots of, knots of stars, clusters of stars. And they're fairly new. They're blue, okay? And 
that has been suggested, this galaxy here is a little bit further than the others because you can see that the knots are actually in the front. So this one's a little bit further, but not much. And this one, this galaxy here is actually interacting with these clusters. Okay. And it's been proposed recently, 2003, that this galaxy here passed through that whole business up there, passed right through it, came down, and this is the trail of debris, in a sense, from the passage of the bottom one through to the top. Okay. So it's quite a stunning picture, even if none of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it likely is. That's the footprint. This woman is the stronger in Italy. She said that's the footprint of the passage of this galaxy to the top two. Now here's a, something really different, Hogue's object. You don't see this very often. It's a bit weird because nobody really knows what's going on here. It's about 570 million years, uh, light years away. It was discovered just in 1950, so modern times. I was even around then. And uh, the ring and the elliptical galaxy are at the same distance. So usually when you get a ring, like we saw the Big Ten, we saw the Big Ten in the sky, that was from the collision of one galaxy with another. But there is no other galaxies in the neighborhood here that could have collided with this elliptical galaxy at the center. There's none. The stars are about 10 billion years old, so this is a very old system. It's been around for a long time. But there are no intruders anywhere. So how did this form? How did you get a ring around an elliptical galaxy? Well, there are lots of theories. Nobody really knows for sure. The most prominent theory is that there was a giant cloud of gas which condensed, and it uh, formed this elliptical core. This, and because of the shape, because it's actually a, an elliptical shape, the dynamics caused some of the gas further out to compress into a ring in some kind of resonance zone where the gravity is stronger and you get this compression and star formation. And I put maybe because nobody knows for sure. It's still a mystery. Hogue himself thought this was a planetary nebula, but it isn't. He didn't have the proper equipment, 1950, to actually see that this is an elliptical galaxy with a ring of stars at the same distance. So it's a bit odd. This is uh, Looking at the, the spectrum, you can see some of it is red shifted, so it's going a little bit faster, and some of it's blue shifted, so it's going a little bit slower. They're all part of the Hubble flow, as it's called, or it's just flowing away from us <laughs> by uh, Hubble's formula. But some of it's dragging its feet. This is going <coughs> slower, and that's a bit faster. Okay, and the same thing here with the, uh, the elliptical galaxy itself. This portion here is going a bit slower than that portion. But it's still a mystery. All right, here's a famous group of galaxies, Stefan's Quintet. It's a bit of a misnomer because there's only four actually at the same distance. We've caught uh, the, this one up here, that's one. There's actually two here. This is two, that's three, that's four. This is nothing. This is in the foreground. So this galaxy here is 7320. It's not associated with the group, but it looks like in the picture. Now, uh, Arp again, he thought this was uh, interesting because it seemed that this galaxy here, which is much, much closer, was somehow interacting with these galaxies here, which were much, much further. There were two wispy tails associated with this. Could be this one here is one of them. These wispy tails, he thought, were associated with this galaxy, and therefore, how could that be because it's so much closer? And therefore, the redshift uh, relationship with distance must be wrong. Well, he was hoping that, but it didn't work out that way because this has nothing to do with the tails, and there's actually another galaxy out of the picture. There's a galaxy somewhere here, not in the picture, that is at the same distance as Stefan's quartet, that, so that would make it a proper quintet if you included this guy over here, and it is affecting the uh, the other four, and in fact, 
have stopped that this is already, according to the fellow I talked to, has passed through the quartet twice already. And that's produced the tails, the wispy tails. The wispy tails have nothing to do with this galaxy, but have everything to do with this sky over here, which you can't see. Okay, it's twice. Runs through the quartet group, and that's produced the wispy tails. Okay, so Mark was wrong. The redshift is intact. Now, this is something really different, one of my favorites, because this is supposed to be a proof of dark matter. So it's really important you get this picture. This proves dark matter. The title of the research paper is was something like a proof of dark matter. So it was that definitive. So what's going on here? Well, we have two, two clusters of galaxies. We have this big cluster of galaxies here. We have a small one here. The small one passed through the big one. Okay? So it's over here. The small one was here. And it passed right through the big one. And now it's over here. Okay? So far, so good. This happened about 150 million years ago. Okay. Now, these contours are where the gravity is strongest and weakest. So it's gravity is strongest here, right? And these rings here, and the gravity is strongest here. Just like a contour map, the highest points, right, are where the action is, and the same thing here. We've got strong gravity, strong gravity here. Okay. Now, they collided, right? The little galaxy has gone right through the the smaller cluster has gone right through the bigger one. Now what happens is all the gas around the galaxies, and there's lots of gas, is superheated, intensely heated, and the gas collides. Okay? Now, where is the gas now? The gas now is here. The gas is here and here. Okay? Now where is the rest of the matter? The rest of the uh, the rest of the matter is here and is here. But most of the matter, most of the ordinary matter, is the gas. Not what you would expect. Most of the matter, ordinary matter, is tied up right here in pink. And this is where the gravity is strongest, here in blue. So the ordinary matter has gotten separated from the gravity, the highest locations of gravity. Okay. And this is where they say is dark matter, here and here. And these two blue regions exactly coincide with the, the gravity map up here. Okay? So this intense gravity here corresponds to not these stars. That they're, up, they're there, but they're not where all the mass is. The mass is here. So the intense gravity is due to black, to dark matter here and dark matter here. And that accounts for the two intense regions up there. So somehow, the dark matter has become separated from the ordinary matter, which is in pink. And when the collision occurs, the dark matter doesn't collide. The dark matter just goes, I've got it right here. The stars and dark matter don't collide. And so the dark matter from the, uh, the original cluster, the large cluster of galaxies, it just sits there. And the dark matter from the, the smaller galaxy, again, just goes with the smaller cluster of galaxies. And so the dark matter doesn't collide, so it stays put with the, the two clusters. But the ordinary matter does collide, ends up here. This is the proof of dark matter. Do you believe it? Well, there are several pictures of this sort. They're beautiful. They're pink and blue, boy and girl. Very nice. And it shows the separation of ordinary matter from the dark matter because of a collision of clusters of galaxies. And the fellow of the Israeli, Mordecai Milgram, who postulated the modified Newtonian dynamics, he has a reply to this picture. So he didn't take it lying down. This modified Newtonian gravity is not dead, he says. This picture does not fill his theory at all. Okay, whatever. Just one more. Pandora cluster. Just another cluster of galaxies, thousands of galaxies. And very high redshift, 0.3. 
which means, means it's moving at 92,000 kilometers per second. If you fire an M1 rifle bullet, it's going at 1.5 kilometers per second. This is going 92,000. So this is much faster than a speeding bullet. Okay. This is apparently due to the collision and merger from other clusters, smaller clusters, and they form this one giant cluster. There's some of these spirals which are not really there. Some spiral galaxies are not part of the cluster, but in the foreground. Still, there's thousands of galaxies here. And what they produce is an intense amount of gravity in one place, and that's called gravitational lensing, where you have some object in the back, which kind of passes through this gravity and gets spread out. And it can be spread out in rings, or it can be spread out into a number of different places, and intensified in uh, this, uh, this light. And here we have the gravitational lensing of the galaxy at A, B, and C. Where's A, B, and C, C down here. These are exactly the same galaxy. And it's far in the distance behind the cluster. And here it is. Here's A, here's B, here's C. And you can see it's highly redshifted because it's completely red. <laughs> so everything's red about it. So it's got to be far, far away. And it is. Its uh, redshift is 9.8, which is uh, astronomical in redshift terms. This means it's about 13 billion light years away. Okay. And it has about 40 million solar masses, so it's kind of respectable as the galaxy goes. 40 million solar masses, not too bad. Okay. And uh, it's about 200 million years old when this picture was taken. So this is the galaxy when it was a baby. And uh, let's see, this was 13 billion light years, so distance. So it was 13 billion years ago, okay, that uh, we're seeing this picture. And at, at this stage here, it's already about 200 million years old. So that <coughs> means when did it form? About 13.2 billion years ago, right? It's 200 million years old, and it's 13 billion years in age. And so add the two, we get about 13.2 billion years when it formed. So that is what? About 600 million years after the Big Bang, we get a galaxy of this sort. But if you remember to the first galaxy, our own Milky Way, it also formed 13.2 billion years ago. So our Milky Way and this guy formed about the same time. So this is like maybe a baby Milky Way right here in its infancy. And then kind of look back and see maybe the Milky Way started out something like this because they were both born at the same time. Okay? I think that's pretty cool. Anyway. There's actually about two trillion more galaxies to go. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been very patient. So I think we'll call it a night. Thank you very much.
Not the same. Well, not in the same. We, we hope that we, every, everybody formed in the same singularity, whatever that was. <laughs> we all came out of that. But we, this was uh, 600 million years after the Big Bang, so everything's moving away from each other. Well, I had a question, John, that yeah. about Mondi, the, the galaxies that have been a lot of dark matter. Yeah. Wouldn't that just prove Mondi on its own? Because how does Mondi, which predicts these no, it's true. That's true. Like rotation curves, and you've got counterexamples? I'm sure if you ask Milgram, he would tell you <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> that those that follow the ordinary Keplerian rotation curves, his equations would amount to the same thing. But I, I couldn't really say, but he has an answer for everything. But, his, but actually his theory is still respectable and there's, there's more evidence being gathered which somewhat leans in his favor. So the, the situation is still in, in flux and it's not decided. Is there dark matter or there isn't? Does gravity need to be modified or not? Nobody can really say for sure. And there's others besides Mon, other theories, very complex theories, that also account for the, uh, the rotation curves without dark matter. So nobody can say to it at this point. Yes. Um, how far is the farthest galaxy that we know of, and is that the end of the universe? Yeah, this, I should have said, this is not the furthest. 9.8 is very high ratio, 13 billion years in, in, the, uh, in distance. The highest is redshift 11, and it's called GZ-11. Okay, it's very clever. And it is about 13.4 billion light years distance. So it formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang. And it's the furthest. That's the very furthest, it looks like a little splodge. And that's the galaxy. GZ-11, if you looked it up, GZ-11. It's called redshift 11, 11.1. .1. And that's the furthest. So far, they might find more you know, tomorrow in the future. Yes. Um, your proof of um, dark matter with the blue and the pink. Yeah, wasn't that a pretty picture? Can we go back to that? Yeah, that was very cool. good. That's one of my favorites, and it's uh, also for various <laughs> other galaxies. <laughs> there is, yeah, can we go back? Various other uh, systems of galaxies have a similar picture. Right. Clusters of galaxies where one has interacted with the other. Um, I think you just exited the presentation. Well, it's gone dark here. <laughs> this is due to dark matter interference. <laughs> okay. okay, so anyway, it's towards the bottom. <coughs> Yes, the picture. The so, pink and blue. Um, it's that pink and blue no. true colors. And well, you pink, pink and is generally x rays, and this is superheated plasma. Right. That glows in pink. So, when, when you say superheated, is that relatively yeah, 30, hot? 30,000 K. Oh, okay. Right. You know, that's hot. <laughs> so, what is the blue? The blue is. The blue, the blue is the dark matter. <laughs> the blue is opposite to the pink. <laughs> the blue is the boy. This is the ordinary matter. I think maybe the blue is the blue is just dark, dark matter doesn't reveal itself, right? That's why it's called fart. Nobody can see it. Nobody knows what it is. So I think it's just an add-on. I think the blue bit. It, it, it refers to the gravity here. The, the dark matter is producing the, the gravity picture up there. And so this blue here has to conform with that picture. Right. So I think that's what this is just thrown in to make it conform. So to show you where all, well, all, the, all the dark matter should be because that's where all the gravity is. Let's show you where the gravity is. It's something that's opposed to pink. It makes a nice picture. The fact that the blue and the red haven't mixed together and created purple. <laughs> um, they does don't that suggest anything? The dark, matter, the dark matter, when this smaller cluster passed through the larger, the dark matter doesn't interact. The dark matter just 
for this larger cluster just stays put. The dark matter for that smaller cluster just stays with the galaxy. So they don't, the, the dark matter doesn't interact with itself right. at all. So it just passes right through, just like the stars. The stars just pass right through. Right? From one cluster to the other. They don't collide or anything like that. But the gas, the, the gas does collide. The gas surrounding these clusters do collide, become heated. And this is, well, they say this is where the mass is. The ordinary mass is here. Hard to believe because you can see all these galaxies here and here. But if you're an astronomer, you will say all the concentration of mass is, of ordinary matter is there. The pink. Okay. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that picture of Ode's uh, object uh, two slides back. Two um, slides, okay, I'll see if I go back. Hoax, yeah, yeah hoax. Have you got a theory for hoax? I was just thinking, uh, I'm looking at the red shirt, and I'm just wondering whether or not that object is actually rotating. Like the whole ring and the whole ring. Well, yeah, it could it. be. It could be. We're not seeing it straight on. We're seeing it slightly at an angle. And so some of it is receding and some of it's coming towards it. This is the bit, right? If this was at an angle in that, then this part would be receding and the bottom bit would be coming towards us. Yeah. These, are, these are the recessional velocities 12,006, whatever, 650, and this is 8 something in red. So the red, so this is the Hubble flow, but uh, some of it is uh, not all flowing at the same rate. And so this bit here is flowing a little bit faster and this bit a bit slower. So it could be rotating. Yeah, it could be rotating, that's a good point. Sure. It probably is rotating. I mean, you know, lots of things in the heavens rotate. They're not just sitting there. So that could be just from the rotation, and we're seeing it slightly. Oh. I have a couple more questions if you want yeah. to do some things. I think that Magellanic Bridge, do you think that's bright enough, bright enough for us amateurs to go out and photograph? Well, that's a good point, actually. I would hope so. Yeah, that's, that's way, way, way back. But the, that bridge was just discovered not so long ago. Of these LL liner stars. If you're a good photographer, I would certainly have a go. I mean, they're there. You just need the right equipment to bring it out. I think this is from the ESA satellite picture. Mm. <coughs> Might be but possible with one of those um, Canon L series lenses that have got the new anti reflective coatings we heard of the Dragonfly telescope yes. used for detecting really low surface brightness objects. So, an ordinary camera or one of those super expensive Canon lenses could possibly. Um, yeah, you need a very wide angle to get both of the galaxies in yeah. the same picture. But yeah, you can be able to. Well, possibly. Somebody got it already. Yeah. Yeah. Make this the last question. Okay. Um, you had to pick 51. Do you know how many galaxies have been imaged? Right, sorry. Um, and 51? No, no, no. You, you had to choose 51 galaxies, but how well, many... Well, how did I choose them? No, no, no. How, how many galaxies have actually been imaged or catalogued? Or, what's the sort of count? Because I, I, you, know, you look at the Hubble deep sky image, yeah. which is you know, one in 30 millionth of the, the sky, and it's got a, a bunch of galaxies in it, you know, hundreds yeah. maybe. Right. How, many, how many galaxies have actually been imaged? What's the catalog count then? Of, galaxies? of galaxies? Does anybody know? I know there's about two trillion. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's going to be a lot of work for somebody. That's for next month's talk. <laughs> 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 you can see all the PCG catalogs. Those are pretty large numbers. There's only a few thousand in EGC and IC. Yeah, there's only 7,800 7, here. Between the two of them, you've got about 13,000, but they're not all galaxies. Uh, but yeah, you've got the PC, I think it's the PCG and the UGC catalogs, which only do galaxies, and there's quite a lot, of, a lot in there, like about uh, seven digits, I think. Six or seven digits. Okay. Hmm. okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there's only 110 Messier objects, so. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Well, thanks very much, Joel. Before we finish, I'd like to uh, present Joel with a small gift of thanks for uh, doing this talk for us. So, thank you very much. And uh, Satya is down in the Matariki room. I wouldn't mind if uh, anyone who's able to help move all these chairs. We've got to move most.